Okay, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about microscopy and cell theory and then we'll talk about the introduction to cells in part two of this lecture. Microscopy is the study of the world using microscopes. I know that's not particularly big, interesting, or um, fantastically revealing, but that is exactly what the definition is. This is the first compound light microscope. It was perfected in the 1600s, and um, as you can see, it's basically a magnifying glass, and it was considered a simple microscope. Simple microscopes means that they have one lens. Compound microscopes means that they have two or more. Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who lived from 1632 to 1723, was a Dutch tradesman and a scientist. He is commonly known as the father of microbiology. He looked at everything he could get his hands on. Using his handcrafted microscopes, he was able to observe and describe single-celled organisms, which he originally referred to as animalcules, and which we now know as microorganisms. He was also the first to record microscopic observations of muscle fibers, bacteria, spermatozoa of various animals, which you see one of his drawings on the left, and blood flow in capillaries. He looked at sections through bits of tree, and the one on the right is the drawing of his one-year-old ash tree trunk. He was so dedicated that he even looked at his own tooth scrapings, so he was a bit weird. During his lifetime, Van Leeuwenhoek ground over 500 optical lenses and created over 400 different types of microscopes. Only nine of those still exist today. His microscopes were made of silver or copper metal frames holding the hand ground lenses, and those that have survived the years are able to magnify up to 275 times. That's almost as good as a standard light compound microscope today. It is suspected, though, that Van Leeuwenhoek possessed some microscopes that could magnify up to 500 times, but those do not exist today. Robert Hooke, who lived from 1635 to 1703, was one of Leeuwenhoek's um, contemporaries. He, he lived a little bit earlier than Leeuwenhoek, but is not considered the father of microbiology. He was primarily an English chemist and mathematician, um, but he was also a physicist and inventor, and he established some of the founding principles upon which Newton's gravitational theories were based, and created the early designs of the steam engine. He also discovered the role of oxygenation in the respiratory system. But in biology, um, he really started to develop microscopy. Hooke's microscope looks a bit more like what we would be familiar with as the compound light microscope. It has an external light source shown by the candle flame here. And he wrote a book called Micrographia in 1665, and he coined the word cell to describe the features of plant tissue that he was able to discover under the microscope. He thought that the empty boxes seen in his drawing of a cork, and you can see that on the right hand side, looked like a monk's cell in a monastery. Thought it was kind of lonely. And that's because cork is actually dead cells. It didn't have anything in it, but he didn't know that at the time. In modern microscope, we have a lot of different things going on. Microscopes have an upper limit of magnification of one half the wavelength of the smallest detectable source. So light microscopes can magnify to 200 nanometers because the lowest light wavelength visible is 400 nanometers. Electron microscopes can magnify theoretically to one half the length of an electron, which is infinitesimally small. Current electron microscopes magnify to about 0.5 nanometers. Simple microscopes have one lens and we call those magnifying glasses. The reception is by the human eye. Similarly, compound microscopes also have the receptor as the human eye. They have two lenses and those are the most common forms of microscopes we're familiar with today. Unlike the other two, though, computers must be used to produce an image from electron microscopes using complex algorithms to translate the beams of electrons bouncing off an object into a visible image. Light microscopes use light as an illumination source to view the specimens. The compound microscope on the left passes light through the specimen, and specimens must be either sliced very thin or be very thin as a whole to see the structures other than a big blob. Through this type of microscope, you can vi view living organisms, and al it allows a view through the organism itself. And you can see this is a daphnia, or a water flea. The dissection microscope, which is on the right, 
can place the light either below the specimen or illuminate from above. This type of microscopes can also view living things <clears throat> and allows the viewer to observe the surface of an object. And so this is also a Daphnia on the right hand side viewed through a dissecting microscope. So you see two different images of the same thing. Electron microscopes have very f have a very few specific requirements. First of all, because electron beams are used, the microscope must be maintained in a vacuum so that the electrons travel in a straight line. You can never have an electron micrograph produced of a living specimen because of the vacuum requirements. So light microscopes, you can see live stuff. Electron microscopes, you cannot. All the specimens also must be coated in gold or some other precious metal or alloy so that the electrons will reflect in a regular manner and produce a good image. They basically atomize the gold and spray it. Computers are used to create the image rather than the human eye, and if you look carefully at both microscopes, you'll see the eyepieces for the viewer to use, but that will still produce a computer-generated image that you're looking at. The microscope on the left is a transmission electron microscope, and the one on the right is a scanning electron microscope. The transmission electron microscope, or TEM, passes electron beams through extremely thin slices of samples. The images produced are through the object, just like with the light, uh, compound light microscope. This is a nucleus showing um, through a TEM on the left-hand side. The scanning electron microscope, or SEM, bounces electron beams off the surfaces of the samples. So you see the images um, of the surface of an object, just like you do with a dissecting microscope. So on the right-hand side, this is also a nucleus using the scanning electron micrograph. So you can see the two compared. Now that the world has been given a decent microscope and knew about the presence of microscopic organisms in cells, that information began to be gathered together into one bundle that we now call cell theory. Cell theory was developed before electron microscopes uh, were developed, but you can see that the light microscopes were very influential in its development. Cell theory resulted from the collaboration of these three men. Theodor Schwann, found um, that all tissues of animal origin that he examined were made of cells. That's him on the upper left. He stated that all animals are made of cells. Matthias Schlieden found that the all tissues of plant origins were examined were made of cells, and he stated that all plants were made of cells, and that's him on the r upper right. Together they determined that the cell is the basic unit of life. Rudolf Virchow, who is another German guy, uh, disproved the concept of vitalism by showing that all cells develop from pre-existing cells. And I'm going to tell you what vitalism is. That's spontaneous generation is another word for it. So these three guys combined came up with cell theory. So all organisms are made up of one or more cells. The cells are the fundamental functional and structural unit of life, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. Those are the three tenets of cell theory. You do need to know those. However, there are a few exceptions. Viruses aren't made of cells, but do show one characteristic of life, reproduction. But it can only happen in a host cell. So um, no, they're not alive. No, you can't really kill a virus. You can inactivate it, but you can't kill it um, because it wasn't alive to begin with. So you do need to know that viruses are kind of considered the exception of cell theory. Also, prions are considered, a, um, and viroids are also considered cell theory exceptions. Okie dokie. Um, we're going to continue with part two, talk, starting off with spontaneous generation, and we'll go from there to the introduction of cells.